Good morning, Ibu. Bisa. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning to all respected attendees and speakers. Welcome to the second webinar of the first trend of the online continuing professional development for Nusantara. This event is a collaboration between the British Council and Peltin. Thank you, the British Council and Peltin, for making this event possible. It is a pleasure that I, Dimas Pujianto, will serve as the Master of Ceremony for today's webinar entitled Future Directions for Teaching English to Young Learners in Indonesia. I want to welcome the Chief Committee of the event, Dr. Dia Royani Meisani, MPD. Good morning and welcome, Budia. A heartfelt and warm welcome is extended to our speakers for today's webinar, Professor Anita Lee from Universitas Katolik Widya Mandala. Good morning and welcome, Prof. Anita. Also, to Dr. Lucy Nurhayati from Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta. Good morning and welcome, Dr. Lucy. Today's webinar is hosted by a moderator, Bapak Mahmud Layan Hutasuhut, PhD, from Universitas Negeri Medan, who is also the director of publication from Peltin. Dear participants, there are a few things we would like to inform you. This session is being recorded and will be uploaded on British Council's YouTube page. By attending, you acknowledge that your comments may be recorded and rebroadcasted. If you would like to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A box on Zoom. At the end of this session, you will be given a link to complete a post-event survey. Link to this, the e-certificate will be provided at the end of webinar three and only to participants who attend all webinars in the first round from webinar one to webinar three. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome the chief committee of the event, Dr. Dia. Royani Meisani to deliver the opening speech and mark the official commencement of the event. To Dr. Dia, the e-stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dimas. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning, Bapak Ibu, esteemed educators and honored speakers. A warm virtual welcome to all of you as we gather for the second installment of our collaborative webinar series hosted by British Council and Peltin under the theme of understanding the educational context. And today's exploration takes us further into the heart of our mission with the topic, future directions for teaching English to young learners in Indonesia. I'm delighted to announce that we have an impressive turnout of uh, 361 participants from across Indonesia joining us in strand one. Uh, your presence here today reflects a shared enthusiasm for continuous learning and a dedication to enhancing the quality of English language instruction for our young learners. It's an honor uh, to introduce our esteemed panelists, both distinguished experts in the field. We have with us today, Professor Anita Lee, renowned uh, for her extensive contributions to language education, and also Dr. Lucy Nurhayati, a respected authority in the realm of English language teaching. Their insights and expertise will undoubtedly provide us with invaluable perspective on the future directions for teaching English to young learners in our country. And we also have Ibu Ika Damayanti, PhD, as the president of Belden. As we navigate through today's discussion, we encourage uh, active engagement from each participant. So please feel free to pose questions share experiences and connect with fellow educators using the chat box. Let's make this not just an informative session, but also a dynamic exchange of ideas that resonates with the challenges and opportunities with, we encounter uh, in our classroom. 
Beyond the confines of this webinar, we invite you to become part of the community of practice established by Pelti. Joining the COP ensures that the conversations spark here today continue to thrive and your contributions help shape the future of English language education in Indonesia. And so far, we are very de uh, delighted. We are so happy to know that uh, the participants have demonstrated an impressive level of engagement and contribution in the discussion forum we provided for a COP. Bapak Ibu, another inform, uh, important information that I would like to share is about the um, Belton membership. I'm sure that some of you might have followed our social media, like Instagram, but how about the membership? So for those who have not joined Belton or are considered membership, we encourage you to take this opportunity to do so. Membership uh, brings a plethora of benefits for English teachers, including access to exclusive resources, professional development opportunities, and supportive network of like-minded educators. To become a membership, kindly fill in the membership form and uh, share it here on the screen and also in the chat box. Once again, Bapak Ibu, thank you for being a part of this collaborative and effort. We look forward to fruitful discussion and hope that today's insights will inspire positive transformation in our classroom. Together, let's shape the future of English language education for young learners in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Back to you, MC. Thank you so much, Dr. Dia. Now we will proceed to the webinar and I would like to invite Bapak Mahmud Layan Hutasuhut, PhD, as the moderator to host the webinar. To Bapa Mahmud, the e stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Pak Dimas, for professionally opening the uh, today's webinar, and also thank you uh, to Ibu Dia for a very lovely welcome. Uh, it is a privilege for all of us here to be able to learn from our first speaker. Uh, in, in today's uh, webinar. Uh, the first speaker is Ibu Professor Anita Lee, MA, EDD. Ibu Professor Anita Lee is a professor, well, yeah, definitely, <laughs> uh, at Widya Mandala Surabaya Catholic University and a consultant on school improvement. She is and uh, she's an advisor of Tanoto Foundation. And she, uh, Ibu Professor Anita Lee, uh, let me uh, briefly go through her education uh, background. She completed uh, her master's degree from, and also her doctor's, uh, doctorate degree from Baylor University. Uh, she focused on uh, English literature for the master's degree and curriculum and instruction for her doctorate degree. Uh, Ibu Anita research interests include teacher development and language learning. And in 2011, she was a research fellow at UC Berkeley and her research on heritage language learning among Indonesian Americans was funded by AIFIS. And she got a 2018 dedicated scholar award from a leading national newspaper, uh, Compass. Uh, and not to mention her teaching experiences, her publications and a lot of professional uh, uh, background. And we can spend the whole day talking about this, right? Ibu Anita? So I think it's best for us uh, to have the presentation from Professor Anita Lee. Ibu, the time is yours. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud for a very generous introduction, and also to Ibu Dia uh, for a very warm welcome. Uh, 
first of all, I would like to thank uh, British Council and Peltin for organizing this and for inviting me. It's an honor for me to be here and then uh, share with you about this. All right, let me um, uh, do my presentation. Please remind me of the time, Pak Mahmoud. Yeah. So I'm assigned to share about future directions for teaching English to young learners in Indonesia. This is really the the time that we will talking about this because uh, um, it perhaps it's long overdue. And uh, let me just um, set the scope first that what we mean here by teaching English to young learners, we set the boundary to primary school level because um, you know we could also talk about it for um, early childhood education, but this is our scope for the moment because this is the context. Yeah, and so the outline that um, I'll be talking about is first the context and urgency and then issues and challenges and then opportunities and future directions. Okay, so context and urgency. Um, this is the slogan set by the uh, Badan Bahasa of our Ministry of Education. And then uh, this is also supported um, by the regulation. There's um, the undang-undang for, for this. And so, yes, prioritize Indonesian, preserve the local languages, but master foreign languages, foreign languages. But within our context here, then we're talking about English. But of course, um, there are a few other foreign languages that schools um, opt to um, include in their curriculum. Okay. So the context here is such that, um, you know, uh, based on this uh, task done by this language um, um, institution organization, Indonesia falls into low proficiency category. Um, we rank 79th um, uh, among the 113 countries, and uh, this is not good. And and uh, the scores here um, may not represent uh, the whole um, population of Indonesia, because as we know, um, the million, the 2.2 million test takers um, around the world and also in Indonesia are those who have the awareness to improve their English and then, um, you know, visit this language school and then take the test, you know, and so this does not represent the general population. And so the uh, our score or results uh, may be lower than this. And um, so, yes, um, there have been overviews of English language instruction in Indonesia, but uh, we uh, haven't been consistent in terms of the policy of uh, putting English um, as compulsory in our primary school curriculum. And so English is still in the EFL status um, overall, but there has been gradual shift also, at least in some parts or some segments of our population. Okay, and so um, here's a, a collection of the literature uh, talking about this, uh, but the urgency, I would argue that, yes, English needs to be included in the primary school curriculum. Uh, you know, among you, the audience, uh, perhaps there's there are the teachers of English at the primary school, yes, um, many schools or a number of schools, primary schools have included English in the curriculum, even the pre-K and K uh, institutions, but it has not been uh, put as uh, consistently in the policy. And so uh, for three reasons, one is learning a foreign language that starts at a young age offers more opportunities for success and English is still the dominant language but two other languages also, uh, or a few other languages also are emerging as a dominant language. And the third reason is social justice, because some schools have put English, um, you know, either as muatan local or as the medium of instruction also in, in some SPK, yeah. But for me, the argument, uh, the reason for that argument is social justice, because if the government does not put that as compulsory, then, um, you know, uh, students or uh, privileged students in some schools get the opportunity to get English education, but not um, students in other schools. But that would uh, lead us to another issue, which is the equity in terms of the quality of English education, but we'll talk about that later. 
Okay, so he, here is some literature, but um, I would not uh, talk too much about this time constraints, um, but the committee will um, send this uh, material to you and so you can click and, and read about this yourself. So the argument that English would change um, our identity or would diminish our national identity, no, no we proved that our, in our study, at least, no, it doesn't, it will not interfere with um, self-identity of our speakers. We, you know, we can speak English very fluently or even at the near native speaker level if there's, if you still believe in Satsum, but it doesn't make us less Indonesian, yeah. And, um, um, you know, the abstracts um, of our um, articles, uh, but they're still in review. And so now what are the issues then and, and challenges? Well, the issues, um, the gap in theory, research and practice, and then readiness of the education system. I argue that, yes, the English should be put in, it's long overdue, yeah, the, that we should put English as compulsory in the primary school curriculum, but then there, there are also challenges uh, about the readiness of the education system. Okay, so theories, um, you know, say that, you know, it, it will not harm to put English or for learners to start learning English at a young age. What matters is not whether we do that or not, but what matters is how uh, we teach um, English, how we uh, use English in our curriculum. And so uh, research says, uh, says that language teachers engage in uh, constructive use of technology, especially the younger teachers, yeah. And so the, uh, and that's also the practice, especially uh, during the pandemic or as the fruit of the pandemic, um, that teachers are, especially the younger teachers are more techno savvy. And okay, here's more literature that, language teachers changed in, in TPAC hot self-perception during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in spite of, you know, a lot of the tragedies during the pandemic, but we do have, um, you know, the uh, blessing in disguise also, the uh, good sides of, of the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. And th th this is also um, another um, article by uh, Chayono, Dr. Chay Professor, perhaps, yeah, Chayono Istikoma Fitria and Gozali about um, writing during the pandemic. And this is another lit literature from Saudi Arabia. So um, it's, a, it's a reflection or it, it's an evaluation of their 15 years of experience of teaching English in Saudi primary schools. So they started putting English in the curriculum in 2004, if I remember correctly. And then uh, findings um, are generally good, but of course there's um, some, some note there that, uh, yeah, so th they are supportive. The respondents here, the stakeholders are supportive to start English early, but the, the, you know, the issues that should also be addressed uh, are, that there's a lack of specialized teacher preparation and that would also potentially be our issue. And so it's good that, you know, we have other countries, uh, the lesson learned from other countries that we could also uh, anticipate that that would also become a challenge for us. And then the resource materials and limited time allocated to English in the curriculum. I would suggest that we also read this uh, article. Okay. And this is still our manuscript about, um, you know, using uh, AI in, in teaching uh, that could also be used, uh, you know, as digital feedback, um, 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 you know, AI, AI assisted uh, feedback that teachers can uh, employ in their teaching. Okay. okay, readiness of the system then. Uh, well, children are using technology faster than the teachers. But of course, there's a spectrum of teachers, you know, the uh, teachers like me, you know, like um, senior in the sense of our age and our years of experience. We also I have to humble myself to, you know, keep asking my, uh, you know, my colleagues, the younger colleagues, how do you do that? How can I do this? How can I fix this? You know, but the younger teachers are more techno savvy. But overall, there's this perception that you know, teachers are relic of the past, you know. Yes, teachers are learning, you know, all teachers, including myself um, and also the uh, senior teachers, teachers are learning, but not they're, but they're not pro progressing 
fast enough. You know, well, technology is really progressing very fast. Sometimes I feel like, oh, oh, another set, another series of applications. What is this? Isn't that, don't we have enough applications and platforms? But yes, uh, this is our world now. Yeah. But it's not only about how fast we, we, we're learning or progressing, but we also have uh, to have the discernment to pick and choose. Well, this is a good platform for me, but not this um, and so on. Yeah. Okay. But the decision to make then, who are going to teach? You know, if we put English at the primary school um, level, we put in the curriculum, that means this is for all primary schools in Indonesia. And um, Dr. Lucy, Pak Mahmoud, you know, we uh, and myself, we're teaching in PPG, especially the dull job. We know that there's really a, you know, big spectrum of teachers in terms of their um, proficiency and competence levels. Yeah. And so the question is, um, should we leave it to the homeroom teachers of primary schools or the teachers of English? That's one issue. And then another one is curriculum and materials development. And I believe the uh, ministry is now uh, developing uh, the materials. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, also invited to, to review um, um, just a little bit of the, of the materials. Yeah. And then breath and death dilemma is um, always uh, needs to be resolved. Yeah. Okay, another um, um, literature. Another study appropriating TPAC in preparation for hybrid learning. So we passed through the pandemic, but blended learning is still, um, you know, a possible innovation in terms of uh, uh, the lesson learned we got through the pandemic and also possible future innovations. Okay. Okay. Now opportunities and future uh, directions. Okay. Okay, well, the opportunities so far, there's no unfavorable opinions among stakeholders to disapprove the plan. Um, we, we had this opinion before, you know, a few years back, but uh, uh, times have changed, contexts have changed. Um, you know, the in the past, unfavorable opinion that, um, okay, I'll switch to Bahasa Indonesia. Oh, sok keming Inggris, kok ngomong Inggris. Um, you know, we are Indonesians. So if you speak too much English, that would interfere with um, the sense of nationalism. But we don't, so far, uh, currently, we don't hear such um, unfavorable opinion yet, even though there's a reminder that, um, and I, I myself also, um, you know, uh, also um, expressing that concern also. I mean, uh, we're all teachers of English, so we do not uh, stand against uh, teaching English at an early age. But, uh, you know, this doesn't mean that, oh, we're all for English that, you know, uh, but the concern that I see also that now uh, there's an emerging um, number of young children who can speak English, or maybe even another foreign language, but they can express themselves in Bahasa Indonesia. And that's a concern yeah, that we should be addressed. Because we want our, our young people of Indonesia to be fluent in English, to be proficient, to be competent in English, but also in our own language, not just the national language, perhaps also the local languages, um, you know, in line with the um, slogan from uh, Badan Bahasa. Yeah. And so learning English at a young age does not mean ignoring the national language and the mother tongues. Because when we, you know, like it's it's an irony that a few parents, of course, not many of you parents, really take the pride in saying, you know, my kids can speak English well and are fluent in English, but they cannot speak Bahasa Indonesia. But the way they say it, they say it with pride. That is like their their children are first class, you know, and, and that's a concern for me. And it's a it's a deficiency, you know. It's not like uh oh, this is not a matter only about nationalism, but it's a deficiency. If you live in any place in any country, then you should be uh, familiar and knowledgeable, not only about the language but also the culture. Yeah, because that would be um, an advantage for us to know the language and the culture, yeah, economically and culturally, yeah. And so, and then uh, the next opportunity is Indonesian, Indonesians are used to interacting fluidly 
and uh, practicing multi languages comfortably. So we use the additive paradigm. Learning an additional language will strengthen our Bahasa Indonesia. That, that's at least from my own personal experience. By learning English, then I fall in love with Bahasa Indonesia even more and then uh, learn uh, to master also the, uh, the language. And then increasing internet access, yes. And so the future direction would be uh, for, um, you know, we would have more uh, speakers, young speakers, young Indonesian uh, speakers of English. And then um, Zuban Zain, and I see in the schedule that uh, Dr. Zain would um, also is scheduled to also uh, speak in the in the series. That there, there's a he predicts that there's a shift in the status and not a foreign language anymore, but shifting towards English as a lingua franca. This is what we're seeing, at least in some segments of our society. Yeah, it's a small segment, perhaps, but their power of influence, their circle of influence is very strong. Yeah. And then more multilingual um, uh, speakers. Um, and then English is no longer seen as the, you know, sole property of, you know, the so-called in Kachru's term, the inner language, uh, uh, inner, yeah, what is it, the 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 first circle yeah the first uh, circle of uh, in world Englishes, which is the USA um, UK Great Britain or Australia but English uh, becomes the language of the world that we could also um, you know um, contribute to uh, to the development of, develop to the development of English and so Indonesians can express themselves express their Indonesianness also in the world stage and thus also contribute to the growth of English. And so, um, and then global English is in translanguaging. Uh, uh, my co-researcher Chao Ming Huat from University of Malaya um, uh, studies that and uh, publishes about uh, translanguaging. Um, so do many other authors. But uh, Dr. Willy Renandia will talk about translanguaging in in uh, the other kind, uh, side of the perspectives. Okay, so now earlier um, in the previous slide, uh, then uh, we have decision to make who are going to teach, the homeroom teachers or teachers of English. I think this also becomes um, things to consider by the ministry and um, either one of the options would have uh, practical and policy implications and administrative hurdles, perhaps. Teachers of English, then, um, you know, the, the ministry has to do a lot of calculation in terms of the number of uh, teachers needed, um, um, whether the PPG, especially the prior job, uh, can do fast enough to meet uh, the need. So that would give a lot more work for Pak Mahmoud and Bulusi <laughs> and myself, yeah. To um, and and we're seeing that yeah uh, before the PPG in English uh, was only for SMP and SMA teachers of English, but now we're seeing um, primary school teachers also. But then this is a matter of speed yeah, um, or the homeroom teachers okay, um, and the administrative hurdles also um, include like other regulations you know like the minimum number of SKS that teachers um, are obliged to teach and that has to be resolved. Okay, and so uh, this would be the kind of the uh, framework that we should um, discuss that, yeah, provided the internet access can be made available throughout Indonesia as promised. Um, I don't remember which Paslon promises this, but whoever gets elected um, this year, uh, whether they promise or not, we can push towards this. Yeah. So there's no campaigning here, but whoever uh, gets elected, then we practitioners and researchers of English should push towards this. And so if internet access um, can be made available throughout Indonesia, then uh, so the dilemma, the decision, whether, of, of course, ideally teachers of English, but that would take time, uh, you know, to prepare and to meet the needs uh, of teachers of English, plus to resolve the administrative hurdle to just overcome the um, regulation issues, 
that would take time. But in the meantime, and time is not on our side. And so perhaps um, a compromise or a temporary breakthrough would be um, perhaps British Council and Palatine would be in the position, you know, to to fill in this gap, you know, while teachers of English um, are still not, um, you know, available in terms of the number uh, for all primary schools in the, throughout Indonesia, then perhaps um, developing online modules. And um, this, you know, a, a while ago, I saw a documentary in, in China. So this is what they're doing, not only in English, but in all subjects, you know, um, like we often benchmark ourselves with Singapore and Finland. And, um, you know, I'm not in favor of that because we have different contexts. Yeah. Like if we want to compare ourselves in terms of, um, you know, like benchmarking, I would uh, suggest we do that with India and China. Because India and China, I mean, with Singapore and Finland, I mean, we have different contexts and situations. But China and India are more similar to us. Big countries, very mixed. Um, inequity is still an issue, um, you know, because it's a big country. Um, and the um, diversity is so, um, you know, overwhelming. Okay. So um, China perhaps also has the same challenges as us in terms of, the inequity across provinces and across regions. And so they, they, they're overcoming that with um, technology and AI, meaning that they've developed learning modules and the learning modules are, you know, uh, in terms of the content. So content delivery is done by experts and they are really good and they're um, just high quality, you know. And the homeroom teachers are trained to facilitate, to be tutor, and um, um, and then deliver that. And we know, yes, um, that uh, technology and AI should not replace teachers, but then technology and AI can assist teachers. And we we are still, you know, um, capitalizing on expert teachers to develop uh, the content, also the, uh, deliver the content while we are still in the process of developing teachers of English. And uh, that should conclude uh, my presentation. Um, I, I'm hoping that, um, you know, I'm complying with the time constraints. So I'll yeah. turn it over to Pat Mahmoud. Yeah, thank yes. you. There are actually uh, three minutes left, Professor. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Professor. Um, I definitely learned a lot from your presentations. I was actually drifted away while listening to your presentation, not because of sleepiness, Professor, I, I assure you, but because of me reflecting on my experiences teaching my pre-service teachers, students, um, and also uh, recently PPG uh, program. And uh, it just reminds me when you talk about who should teach uh, the subject English and I just had one of the I don't know uh, whether to say this uh, I, I wouldn't say a terrible experience but uh, one of the teachers that I teach right now uh, on PPG program uh, well she before joining the program, uh, she teaches other subjects other than English, whether it is PPK and, and or other subjects, not English. And now she joins the program and has to learn how to teach English. I'm not really sure how to support her. I mean, like I tried, I did try my best to support her. Uh, it's just also because uh, my presentation last week is about uh, how to support yourself before supporting uh, pre-service teachers. What do you think of this, uh, Professor? I'm interested. I mean, like, what do you, uh, you, know, you know, your opinion about this, Professor? Yes, um, it's a very interesting um, situation and issue, Pa Mahmoud. Yeah. And this is really, um, you know, a, a, a very complex uh, situation for Indonesia because we do have really a big spectrum of teachers, either 
teachers of English or teachers of other subjects. You know, it's really hard to pinpoint like the overall proficiency level. Of course, we can do that. We can find the mean or the median of our teachers' uh, proficiency level, either teachers of English or teachers of other subjects, because then we because we do have a very big range. You know, um, uh, Pak Mahmud and Bulusi and myself know that when we especially when we're teaching the in service teachers, right? In in PPG. We do have a very big um, range, you know. I've got teachers who speak English like very fluently, um, you know, flawlessly. But we also have teachers, especially, again, especially in in Daljab, that you know they they were struggling to just follow our conversation in English, yeah, and um, you know, like they, they just cannot um, answer or respond to us in English, um, let alone that sometimes they cannot comprehend what we're, we're saying. Yeah, And so we do have that, that spectrum. Uh, on the other hand, teachers of other subjects too. And this is also a phenomenon that um, you know happens in our country, also in some other countries that, that um, young, young graduates of other majors, other programs, but they can speak English very fluently. I mean, uh, perhaps they got it uh, during their pre-college years, you know, and they can and and some private schools. This is also to answer Pak uh, Irfan, Pak Irfan's question. Yeah, that um, some private schools hire such teachers, you know, not necessarily teachers of English, but they hire teachers from the physics department, from chemistry department, from you know, um, so social studies department uh, to teach the subjects in English. And we do have such teachers also. And so, yeah, and I think the Pepe Gate Prajap also has opened doors, yeah, not only to graduates of the uh, LPTK, but also graduates, at least graduates of the English literature, or uh, yeah, uh, just English related for PPG, Prajap for English, and so this is a phenomenon that that policy should um, should encapsulate, yeah, should also integrate into the the execution or the design or the execution of the policy. Um, let me know if I answer your question, Pak Mahmud. You you did, Pak. You did. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I'm, I'm glad. Okay, so I can, you know, think about other ways to support that particular teacher uh, yeah. during the program. Thank you so much, Prof. Yeah. And we have some questions here from uh, participants. And uh, yes, you have addressed uh, Pa Irfan's question while answering mine. And there is yeah. another que another question here from Pa Eko. Yeah. Gladly, the technology TPAC has integrated to teaching learning. However, yeah. teachers sometimes have difficulty in terms of technology and connect, is it content perhaps, to be uh -huh. accommodated in TPAC? Is there any suggestion? What can the teacher do? Okay. Well, this is a very um, relevant question by Echo or Ibu Echo, yeah? Sulistiani, I think it might be Ibu Echo. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, oh, uh, echo. yeah, you echo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, it's very relevant. Okay. We, we did um, a couple of studies uh, uh, on TPAC framework. And um, our insights would be that, yes, teachers have different situations and challenges in terms of technology mastery. That, you know, I'm not. Yeah, I, I love technology. I try to use technology as best as I could. But I, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to like, uh, you know, um, to say that all teachers have to use this kind of technology because situations are different. Best technology is technology that you can use in your own context. Yeah, because like, if you get a new platform very advanced and then you learn that and you can do that, but it doesn't work with your students, meaning that, you know, your students do not have the 
gadget that would support that or the internet access, then leave it. Don't use that technology, you know. Um, so that that's one. And second, um, even though we use um, certain kinds of technology, then uh, the pedagogy. So TPEC is technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. So uh, technology should not be the driver in this TPEC. Of course, all three areas have to to be synchronized, have to be to be um, you know uh, connected. You know, so technology, pedagogy, and content, and all three should support and enhance one another. But don't let the technology uh, drive. You know, technology can assist, but the pedagogy and the content. So we studied this in um, a few of our articles, which I have uh, put the link um, on our slide. That yeah, what I mean, content is something that you know we talk about it. The teachers of English also have a big range of proficiency levels. Okay. Mm -hmm. So pedagogy is the ability for us to manage the class, to give effective support, to motivate, and also to um, you know, activate your students' cognitive processes. So uh, I think of all three, I mean, all three are important, but the, your pedagogy would be your stepping stone, you know, uh, meaning that teachers should continue to develop the content knowledge and also the technology as far as it's relevant and contextual, okay? okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh -huh. uh, Another question here, it's quite interesting. Which comes first when teaching young learners, the method or the content, especially considering the time in the classroom and how, the, how to scaffold the given material according to differentiated learning, especially in teaching EYL? Okay, this is a very good uh, question. I like this question. Method or content, well, this is what teachers, including myself, like. We give them options, but uh, I'm a rebellious student, so I like to go beyond these two options. Okay, mm -hmm. method and content are important, but what is most important, the underlying um, uh, principle is meaning for yeah. communication okay like when we develop content for instance i mean method is important because you know teaching for young learners you have you know it requires very engaging entertaining entertaining methods so that um you know um, young learners uh, feel motivated and feel um you know the relevance of learning english but meaning should be there let me give you an example uh like, um, you know, I happen to be reviewing. Um, so like in, in sometimes in some lesson, we're teaching them about uh, time, about, uh, you know, I get up at 5.30, you know, like somebody, let's say, uh, okay, um, Budi, okay, Budi is, is a famous name in, in textbooks. Okay, Budi gets up at 5.30 and in Budi, takes a shower at 5.30. Budi has always has breakfast at 5.45. Grammatically, content-wise, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but it doesn't make sense. You know, like, Budi gets up at 5 o'clock or you want to teach them adverb of, you know, like adverbs, like, Budi always gets up at 5.30. That makes sense. That's reasonable because when you set your alarm clock, 5.30, then yes, you get up at 5.30. But the next sentence, Budi takes a shower at 5.45 or has, has breakfast at 5.45, you know, that doesn't make sense. You cannot say Budi always has breakfast at 5.45. You know, sometimes Budi takes a shower longer than before or faster than before, okay? Um, so yeah, uh, that's an example. So why not? also uh, introduce around. Buri usually, uh, you know, has breakfast around 5.45. You know, sometimes at 5.35, if he takes a shower faster, or when he's getting up, he's waking up, but he's not getting up, you know, right after that. So uh, pay attention to the meaning, 
you know does it make sense or not you know if it doesn't make sense then yeah. uh you know this incorporates both method and content okay like we're teaching the language for them to communicate for us to deliver the meaning not just to teach them the grammar points okay uh, i hope i answered so, uh, that question yeah yes so it's all about how to make meaning in context right yes Professor? yes yes <laughs> Right, so uh, another question here from, from Ibu Safrida Lubis. What do you think of integrating coding in ELT? I've tried to introduce pre-service teachers on how to weave coding, computer programming in ELT. Two coding programs that I have tried to introduce are Scratch and Tinker coding activities in English class. The response is positive, but for elementary students, I think co-teaching is needed. I mean, collaboration between English teacher and IT teacher. So it's all about integrating coding in ELT, Professor. What do you think? Okay. Well, uh, Ibusa Frida Lubis, I have to say humbly that I do not know think Scratch and Tinker. And so... Uh, so I cannot answer your, your question specifically about Scratch and Thinker, but what I could say is if that works for you, then go ahead and do that. If the response is positive, then I would support you to continue doing that. And uh, and so uh, Busa Frida Lubis is a teacher educator, yeah, I, I assume, because you're teaching the pre-service teachers. And then you'll be even coding, and th that's great. You know, if you could use all the um, that technology, the AI, um, IT, you integrate that into your teaching, and then you expect. Um, and um, you know, I'm also hopeful that what you're doing with the pre-service teachers would work because you know, we know that pre-service teachers, the younger teachers, are very techno savvy and they learn very fast. So if, the, if that works, then go ahead and do that and write about that, uh, Busa Frida, so that we can learn. And I'm also, uh, you know, I would like to also learn from you uh, about this. Yeah. All right, uh, that's my answer. I hope that satisfies yes. uh, Ibu Safri. I agree with you, Prof. Whatever works for you, go ahead. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think we still have an, uh, time for another uh, question here, Prof. Uh, okay. This is from pa Asap. Uh, I do agree with you, Ibu, regarding to the opportunity that it doesn't mean when we are learning English or other languages, ignoring our mother's uh, mother tongue, perhaps national, la national mm -hmm. language. So my question is, how, we, how do we guide and facilitate our students to be, you know, to get used to use, you know, to get used to English in communication, making English as a kind of habit in communicating, uh, you know, our ideas. Hmm. Right. Okay. Yes. Asep, yeah, this is a, also a very important question that, Using a language is not just a cognitive process. It's also an affective process. You know, like um, some people are very um, uh, competent or proficient, like let's say in terms of accent, you know, like some people can adopt um, like a, an accent that is so different from their uh, local language accent which is fine, but some other people would, and then we see that also, we see that variety among speakers of English from different countries, you know, some some others would just, just cannot, um, you know, like cannot leave the local accent, which is also fine, I think, mm -hmm. as long as you're comprehensible, that you are understood by other speakers, um, that's also fine. But in terms of... Um, you know what uh, Asap is saying that how can we teach them to be like to be familiar with English as a foreign language how do we guide and facilitate our our students for communication well we could do like um you know like you know the my previous response that we use the language for meaning it's not just for to teach the 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 language as a subject yes of course there's some you know, pollination said that sometimes we need to teach the content, the, the rules of the language. 
but that's not let's not spend the whole teaching hours to just talk about the rules of the language but we also use the language and so um, that's the habit then I would also and th th that is um, now made very possible in this time not in my time as a learner now here you know we have the exposure of um, English YouTube podcasts TikToks everything the internet is you know at our disposal and young learners could um, access that and that's why internet is important yeah and so uh, in our time and perhaps also still in some regions you know like when we you know have like a, a tourist I still remember in those days you saw a tourist and you said mister mister can I <laughs> practice my English with you you know, but now we could practice through YouTube, through and we see like an emerging number of young speakers mm -hmm. who speak with you know that native speakers accent, mm -hmm. even though they're not getting lessons, formal lessons in English. But who's their teacher? YouTube, yeah. Um, and so that's very possible to do that. Um, movies, songs, um, those are resources, but um. The other side of that is that, again, that, uh, you know, we want our young learners, our young Indonesians to be fluent in English, but also to be fluent in Bahasa Indonesia, to no. just be proud of being Indonesian and speak yes. Indonesian well. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. There are other questions, but I'm afraid we are running out of time, Prof. Uh, but we will try to uh, to get the the questions to the um, to the to our WhatsApp group and discuss uh, the answers there, the answers to those to those questions who have not been answered. So again, uh, we would like to thank you uh, very much, Professor, uh, to make the time uh, to present here in this webinar. Uh, so thank you, and um, we definitely would like to learn more from you in the future, Professor. Okay. Thank you, Pak Mahmoud, for moderating, for sharing this session very efficiently, and to all thank of you who have participated. Thank, thank you, you, Prof. Okay. I think uh, we will uh, welcome uh our next speaker um okay give me a minute take your time okay so um all right so our next speaker uh is our next presenter is ibu lucy ibu dr lucy nurhayati m applied linguistics am i right ibu yeah, right. in tisol yeah so ibu lucy works for universitas negeri yogyakarta uh, in english education uh, program study program uh, she completed her master's degree at Macquarie University, Australia, and uh, she, she did her doctoral degree in Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta in Ilmu Pendidikan Bahasa. Uh, Ibu Lucy has conducted a lot of, you know, um, a lot of different research here, including the, the most recent one is developing culturally responsive EYL teacher education curriculum participatory action research. And she has been, uh, she has involved in a lot of professional um, experiences, including um, Penulis Buku Ajar SD, right Ibu? So Ibu Lucy is an expert ago. in yeah. EYL. So I'm so glad that we have Ibu Lucy as our second presenter. Uh, it's an honor, Ibu Lucy, to have you. And I think without further ado, without taking your time anymore, 
I would like to welcome you to this um, webinar and please, the time is all yours, Ibu Lucy. Okay, thank you, Pak Mahmud, and also thank you all of the committee. Also, thank, thank you, Professor Anita, for a very inspiring and insightful presentation. And good morning, dear audiences. Uh, allow me to share the screen, Pak Mahmud. Can you see the screen? Yes, now? yes, we can, right. Ibu Lucy. But okay. uh, can, can you, uh, I think the volume is not. My voice? How is it now? Yes, your voice, Ibu Lucy. Okay, what about now? Okay, it's much better. It is okay. much better. All right, okay, so I think I need to get myself closer to the device. All right, so good morning, everyone. I'm so happy and delighted to be here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, British Council and Peltin, uh, because uh, this, this is my first time actually uh, being a panelist or presenters for Peltin and for uh, British Council. Yeah, I mean, in front of so many uh, teachers and also lecturers, maybe, or, and all, all educators committed to the improvement or betterment of English language teaching in Indonesia. All right, uh, so I think today we are going to explore and also discuss a topic that holds immense significance for uh, the future of Indonesia, that is the uh, uh, future direction subtitle in Indonesia. Okay, uh, so I think uh, I will not talk a lot. Yeah, it will, uh, Professor Anita has covered a lot of things. Uh, there are four things that I'd like to talk uh, other than background. I think I want to talk about the current states and also challenges and finally the future direction of TAIL in Indonesia. I've been involved in TAIL since our students, I think, 2001. Yeah? And then uh, I was involved in many activities starting for teaching in kindergarten and then elementary school, and then writing books, and then managing uh, like uh, English programs for children, and also writing some, uh, what is it, uh, audio materials for children like that, and uh, some more. And I do hope my past experience will also uh, add some maybe uh, valuable information for everyone here, yeah? All right, so uh, when I read the, the topic, I kept thinking about why should we talk about the, the direction? Yeah, of course, we need to talk about the direction in tail because I myself somehow, uh, I got the feeling that there are times when we are losing our direction, yeah? Or maybe it's like we are in a vegetative state, yeah, in terms of tail. Yeah, we are there, but actually we're feeling we are not there because there are no support, uh, limited support for us, uh, especially in the beginning of the launch of 2013 curriculum, I think, yeah. I remember there, um, there were tensions, yeah, uh, uh, against tail, yeah, from some, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, not everyone, but some people were concerned of uh, the status of English in our country, yeah. Uh, some people consider uh, English, uh, introduction of English in uh, primary schools as a threat to local and national cultures. And so uh, we, we've been in that uh, situation and I think uh, now we are moving to a better state. Yeah. So I think uh, we need to talk about direction for tail because we have a commitment to realizing Golden Indonesian 2040 visions. We need a uh, future generation who are able to communicate, who are able to uh, voice uh, themselves, yeah, who are able to compete and blah, and blah. Yeah? And the second, we need to respond to the changing dynamics in society, in education, uh, science, technology, etc. You know, because uh, I think all of us know, uh, uh, nowadays we are in a globali uh, in globalization era uh, with different ways of living styles, uh, communication style, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to put this into discussion. And then we need to talk about direction because we, we should anticipate potential challenges or problems. And, and also we need uh, persp uh, purposeful and sustainable progress or objectives uh, to reach. Yeah. 
And in order to set the direction, I think uh, we need to understand our own uh, final goal or ultimate goal uh, of our journey yeah, in tile. And also we need to understand uh, current states, our current development of tail in our country. Then we need to be able to self-assess ourselves, you know, and we need to know the challenges, potential risks that we, we might face in the future or, or maybe at the moment. Okay. Um, all right. So to discuss with you, I've uh, read some resources. Most are taken from the British Council websites, and I can provide the link, I think, uh, for you, and I can post that in the group, yeah. So uh, the work from uh, Garton, for example, and also Carol uh, Reed, and also David Valente, and some others uh, will be covered in our discussion today. Uh, okay, let's start from this one. Uh, the thing that inspired uh, my presentation today is uh, the article from Car Carol Reed. Yeah? It's about the ABC of changes in PLT or in Tile over the last 30 decades. Somehow, I think uh, what she has written there is relevant to what's happening in Indonesia. But of course, I cannot talk about everything here, but I think I really recommend you to visit uh, the link, yeah, I mean, to also read, so you have a better perspective about uh, tile globally and also tile in Indonesia. All right, so that the from A to Z, yeah, and I think uh, I, I think I will uh, I have I have marked curriculum methodology policies and expertise there, and maybe our discussion today will uh, tend to talk about those aspects. All right. Also, I think uh, we need to read the report of Global Implementation of TYL, or TYL uh, from Garten, Copeland, and Burns. Yeah, they talk about factors influencing the introduction of English in primary school globally. And I think it's more or less similar. So uh, it has to do with economic development, parents' pressure, and also assumptions that earlier is better, yeah, even though um, I I do not hundred percent agree. I think all of us uh, do not hundred percent agree with uh, the last assumption. So I think uh, most all of us uh, agree that uh, English is not just a skill for us, but that's uh, like a, a gate to a lots of opportunities yeah, for our children in the future. So that's why uh, I think many parents are concerned about uh, English. Okay. So they sent uh, their children to courses, invited uh, maybe private lecturers, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, maybe teachers at home, and forcing schools to provide English at that schools. Yeah, and sometime, uh, so the things is that sometime in order to fulfill parents' demand, the school then just uh, recruit uh, summer EY or teachers like is not really qualified teachers, I think, because maybe these these teachers are not available or the schools uh, do not have a link to where to find uh, qualified EY or teachers because they are very rare actually. Okay, so uh, in this report you will find a uh, 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 explanation about challenges happening uh, globally and. They are they divided into two levels, macro and uh, macro and micro levels. The, well, if we talk about uh, macro levels, then it has to do with policies, yeah, uh, and also things happening in the society, such as inequalities. Okay, and I think somehow it also happens in, in our country. We'll talk about that later. And and a micro a micro level, sorry. Uh, they talk about pedagogy, learners, class contact, assessment and examination, teacher trainings and recruitment and some other thing, I think. Now, because um, our topic is future direction of Indonesia, I think we need to reflect on uh, our situation in Indonesia. I think uh, maybe you, if, well, you can write something, you can type something about challenges that 
we are currently bashing uh, basing in our country yeah you can you can write yeah okay maybe i give you minutes to write uh, either challenges we are currently facing or maybe things that uh, concerns you the most about a tyl yeah or maybe positive development about uh, tyl in indonesia maybe yeah you can write something can you and i will come back to that all right so uh, my presentation then we'll talk about this yeah challenges all right so uh but mahmoud have just uh explained to you that my latest research has to do with uh attempt to develop a culturally responsive eyl teacher education uh through participatory action research uh, well this is a micro scale research of course and uh, the thing I have written in the slides, actually, the result of, uh, uh, what is it, my research. Well, there are some questions in my research. And one of them is the, the analysis of uh, the political and societal situation in Indonesia, and also in uh, university providing uh, EYL teacher education. Uh, and a little bit about uh, uh, EYL practice in, in primary schools. So uh, I invited some uh, stakeholders, like uh, I call that as a, a quadruple helic actors. So some representatives from schools, for example, and then industries, and then also uh, academia, academia posts, and EYL practitioner, practitioners, sorry, and then students, yeah, and government, yeah, okay. So in that, uh, I did uh, lots of discussions with them. So we concluded that uh, the biggest challenge uh, regarding TEYL in Indonesia, the first is the adequate uh, policies and regulation related to TYL in almost in all levels, for example, in terms of the status of English, of course, all of us uh, always wanting to set English or primary English as a compulsory uh, subject, because, you know, we are the only country, if I'm not mistaken, in Southeast Asia, yeah, so not putting English as a compulsory subject in primary education, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but then we also understand that to set such a policy is not easy because we are a huge country. There are so many things to consider. And Prof. Anita has just mentioned one, one, one thing, one important thing is about teachers, the quality of the teacher and also the quantity of the teachers. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, there are 1.6 teachers of elementary schools, I think, yeah. And so if if we set English in primary schools, maybe we will need those numbers as well. Yeah. Okay, so who's gonna teach? Are we going to make the homeroom teachers teaching English? Are they capable? Of course, not all of them are capable. Yeah, and the data, the, the data show that, yeah. Okay, for example, that's a, that's a school uh instructing the homeroom teacher to teach english but she's not really capable and then when um, my students coming there she just say please help me teaching english for my students so my student is like uh, uh doing practicum there yeah so it's quite funny because uh when coming to school uh for example the student uh uh, uh should have like guidance from the teachers at schools but it didn't happen so yeah that's a complex thing so again back to this policies is important i know uh governments also know about this but again indonesia is such a huge country there are so many things to consider when we set uh regulations about tl tyl but uh we need to make decisions soon about this yeah and i think there are some progress, there are some improvement now uh, because now we have a uh, new policy about uh, 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 that implements uh, the TYL. So 
before uh, before this i think we don't have uh, i mean uh, while i'm doing my research uh, the curriculum and also the decision about what what is that uh, linearity uh, linearity of teachers yeah itu belum launching yeah i think there are some uh, some new improvement card Okay, the second thing is, uh, Ibu Prof Anita mentioned about social justice, yeah, and I think yes, yeah, that's also our our concern. That's also a big issues in Indonesia. That's a gap, disparities of access. Okay, some, okay, maybe students studying in elite schools or private elite schools will have a good access. Uh, will have access to qualified teachers, good resources, like global, global, maybe book, yeah, global course book, I mean, and facilities. But then students coming to ordinary state schools, like rural, school, uh, rural schools, right? Oh, well, maybe they will not have those access, yeah, not access for good teachers and even not access to, uh, to English. So this is uh, that, that so many inequality, yeah. And inequality is not only for students and also I think for EYL teachers. Yeah. Okay. All right. And also policy changes. We know there are so many changes on the uh, on policy in Indonesia. See, if I feel like uh, we need um, a clearer roadmap. Yeah. Of our our uh, view future vision, perhaps about tail step by step. I think. Yeah, we need to have that like a, a clear roadmap. Yeah, and okay, I'll I'll I also talk about uh, I'll, I'll we also identified the challenges in terms of public perspectives. Yeah, I think it, it it's in line with uh, what Prof Anita has said. Yeah, not everyone's happy with the introduction of English in elementary schools. Yeah. Some some students and also some parents actually yeah well they said yeah why why should we learn English it's not important in Indonesia you don't need to speak English yeah so they they also get about this yeah okay all right so uh yeah public perspectives and attitudes about English is actually different I think yeah okay so right and then let's move to the second one the the challenges is on the meso or and micro levels okay uh. I we concentrated on things happening in teacher education or university and also schools. So we identified that we have problems and issues with with curriculum and pedagogy. Okay, uh, so curriculum in the primary school levels and also curriculum in the levels of teacher education uh, in university at university. Yeah, curriculum plus pedagogy. I think, yeah. All right. So, uh, for example, uh, yeah, Bu Anita mentioned about the depth and breadth. Yes. Maybe, uh, so I'm teaching in Yogyakarta State University. We have a very good uh, EYL pre-service teacher program, I think. But still, we, we think that it's not, it's not yet ideal. So, we need a more com comprehensive uh, curriculum, you know. And also, yeah, pedagogy. Yeah, uh, all right. So, what I mean by pedagogy is well, in the level of university, uh, some lectures teaching in uh, pre service English teacher programs, for example, well, they actually uh, do not have tail qualification. So, they are learning by doing. So, that's happening in the university level. And in school level, also, yeah, not all uh, in-service teachers, for example, having a good uh, content knowledge quality and also pedagogical policy quality and also TPEC. So, right, okay. Yeah, Ibu Prof. Anita and Pak Mah Mahmud, yeah, correct, yeah, when uh, telling about the dynamic in PPG, yeah, uh, so, and also maybe some of your joining PPG now, yes, you know, you know, uh, the quality of, of our teachers and their knowledge about the pedagogy of uh, tail and general. Okay, and also uh, challenges on the aspect of teacher education and training and recruitment. So uh, I've mentioned earlier, yeah, we have we have so many problems with teacher education and training. Uh, not all university, for example, uh, provide uh, 
it will help teach your education. Yeah. And some, yeah, those who provide, uh, I mean, the university providing EYL teacher education program, uh, they have different standards. Yeah, some only three SKS, for example, another twelve SKS and blah and blah. So there isn't any standard. Yeah, and that's uh, that's difficult also for for us. Me, for example, I'm dealing with teacher uh, education. It's so hard to change. For example, I'm asking for uh, adding the number of SKS. Of course, it's it's, it's kind of hard, yeah, because uh, because of the policy. Yeah. Okay, teacher training uh, recruitment. Okay, we talk about the teacher recruitment at the school level. So in Yogyakarta, we said it as SAE, ya, asal ada yang mau ngajar. Yeah, seperti itu. So uh, we did actually uh, standard about the recruitment of the teachers. We are wishing to have like a, a certification body. Yeah. So those who coming to class teaching our kids should earn a special certificate or maybe Pelton can provide that kind of training in the future. Yeah. So if they do not have that kind of certificate, they shouldn't be able to teach. But that's only, I think, my hope. Yeah. Okay, also a problem regarding infrastructure and facilities and empowerment. Yeah, because uh, my research was a participated excellent research. Of course, we concentrated on empowering uh, all stakeholders uh, in a, in a, in a, what is it? Uh, well, in a positive collaboration. Okay, and because uh, we see that. Uh, Empowerment is is an important issue, but not not all of us, not all parties in uh, in education field are aware of this. Yeah. So okay, uh, well yes, we need to help teachers, for example, by providing resources and blah and blah and blah. But I think we shouldn't be in 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 the position to spoon feed them, right? So we need to be able to educate them, empower them. Uh, make them collaborate, something like that, so they're able to solve the problems themselves. Okay, all right. So, um, uh, what important challenges also are related to the diversities of students we have in Indonesian setting, especially well, in my studies in Jakarta, yeah. Okay, so we know. Uh, I don't need to explain that. Yeah, our students diapers in in terms of social cultural background, ability, uh, maybe attitudes, and also uh, preferences and many more. Okay, so and uh, well, I think as 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 teachers, uh, we need to highlight this. As a teacher, we need to understand our students, uh, and this is not easy. You know, this especially when teachers need to handle 40 students in the class, 30 students in the class. Of course, it's, it's not easy to understand uh, the need of individual students. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. And then uh, other challenges has to do with the expertise. I think I will not talk about that. Yeah, I talked about that just now. Materials and resources, assessment and evaluation, and also research on title. But for the last thing, I think. Okay, research on TYL is uh, still very limited, yeah, to my experience. So I think we need more people doing research on this. Okay. Right. Now, uh, luckily, uh, we have some we'll positive see, developments. Yeah. Two, mi two more minutes, Ibu. All right. Sorry. Okay, All right. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So there are some positive uh, developments happening in our countries. Actually, yeah. Now we have a uh, emancipated curriculum, and uh, there are uh, some attempts to to make uh, uh, stakeholders collaborate. Uh, okay. Uh, in uh, to make a uh, uh, tail in Indonesia coming to a better state. Okay. All right. So I think I will just go down to this one okay so uh, i think uh my voice about future directions will be divided into two aspects the first regarding the policy so i think uh a clear policy of the tail status is very necessary yeah uh, we've been holding this for a long time ago i think uh we need to make a decision about this now 
and then we need policies on strategies for continuous professional development for tail educators and then we need to have policy of monitoring and evaluation uh, for the policy itself and also for the implementation of the tail and then we need to and uh, encourage uh, and support research initiative and innovation in tail maybe providing funding and should be part of the policies and for practical things uh, of course we need to have a comprehensive tyl curriculum yeah maybe combining international standard cultural and linguistic context of indonesia uh, and and other, i mean international standard and uh, and and indonesian uh, context i mean all right and then i agree that we need to uh, uh, what integrate local cultural tradition into teyl materials and methodology and then implementing children friendly pedagogy and of course maintaining a balance between play based learning and formal instruction ict integration and also research Okay, strengthening uh, teacher education, of course, that's very prominent. And I think what I've said, empowering teachers and educators is also very important for the future direction because they will facing many, uh, many uh, uh, issues and also challenges. So they need to be able to solve their own problems. Okay, I think, yeah, I will close this presentation by uh, saying this. So lost direction is not the end of the journey. They are a chance to discover a new path and redefine the destination, like what I've said. Maybe we've, we've got the feeling that, that we're uh, losing our direction a long time ago, but uh, I do hope that now we have discovered a new path and a destination to go. And thank you so much. Okay, with Palatine, I think we will grow together and we'll grow better. Thank you very much, Pak Mahmoud. Thank you so much, Ibu Lucy. I love that last quote. Lost directions are not the end of the journey. They are a chance to discover a new path. One, when one door is closing, another door opens, right, Ibu Lucy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So while waiting for questions uh, from the participants, um, I would, I would like to know, um, what about the resources from the BC, uh, British Council websites, Ibu Lucy? Did you find any, uh, resources from the BC website useful for you? Uh, I mean, like in supporting pre-service teachers or also in supporting, uh, our fellow teacher educators in supporting pre-service teachers? Um, any particular resources that you yes, would, I have, you would okay, find you. useful? Yes, Ibu. Yes, I have listed at least one, two, three, four, or five, uh, five resources maybe, and I can maybe add some more later on. So uh, mm -hmm. to, to understand about our topic today, I really suggest you to read uh, this, for example, a report from Garten, Copland, and Burns, and also Reeds and Carol, and also mm. other other resources. I think, yeah. For example, in Aya Tepo, who Korean Peso, they also provide. They they uh, have provided many insightful information. I think regarding to the directions of Tail Indonesia and also uh, the implication for the development of uh, EYL teachers or educators. I think. So they are those resources uh, focus on EYL teaching and learning. Bulusi? Yes, uh, hmm. uh, mostly yes because I mostly. I think I rely on the topic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm so sorry. Well, if there are some of the participants, perhaps yeah, it's not really uh, practicing TYL. Yeah, I do hope that we can also learn some other things from my presentations. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have one question here from Ibu, hopefully I'm right this time, Ibu Winda Dewi, must be Ibu. 
Okay, hello Ibu Lucy. It's very confusing for homeroom teachers to teach English and English teacher to teach elementary school materials. It happens to some of my friends. They need to teach some subjects such as math or science. So perhaps I think what Ibu Winda here uh, is asking here, what do you think of this situation, Ibu Lucy? You know, homeroom teachers to teach English and English te teacher to teach yeah. elementary school materials. Yeah, that will what be very think? hard for them, yeah. Okay, hmm. We know in our PPG, yeah, Pa Mahmud and Pa uh, the end Prof Anita. Yes, as I shared I earlier with Ibu yeah. Prof. Yeah, Ibu yeah, Prof. For example, Anita. I have one participant from Kalimantan telling Ibu, please apologize. Uh, my English is very bad. I've already forgot my English. I stopped teaching English for about eight years. Uh, okay, so they, well, she thought, I don't know, maybe something else. It's not English, yeah. So, mm. or, yeah, there are many things happen like that. And now, well, yeah, of course, for example, homeroom teachers, usually they graduated from, what is that, PGSD, yeah? PGSD, yeah? Mm -hmm. And in PGSD curriculum, I believe most of them, I think, yeah, only offered maybe two or three credits of English, right? So how can they have sufficient uh what knowledge of english you know so that must be very hard for for the teachers yeah having no background of english and also for english teachers yeah you know if they want to teach in elementary and elementary school and got what is it certificate certificate guru yeah uh in the past they need to have two certificates PGSD certificates yeah Mm. And also maybe English, so they 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 they, they can get that uh, certificate itu ya. So even for them, it's very hard. Uh, they background is English, but they have to teach all subjects. And I think, well, the party says, well, it's very hard for me to accept that reality. I think yeah. Uh, and I'm so sorry for the students too. Yeah. Mm. Maybe the the teacher, are fluent in English, are capable in teaching English, but not in teaching math for example maybe they don't like math that's why they went to english education department right so yeah ibu winda thank you uh, i i i agree with you yeah it will be very confusing and i do hope that uh the new policy will yeah will will give a um, new direction yeah or uh yeah changes you know, for the, the practice of english in elementary school yeah and i think mm -hmm. uh yeah, per perhaps uh, it, it gives space for, you know, resources from the BC here for the English teacher, uh, just like what Ibu Winda uh, said, you know, uh, confusing. So perhaps we, we can suggest that there are some materials uh, on BC websites that could be or should be useful for Ibu Winda and uh, her colleagues, you know, ready to be used, right, Ibu Lucy? Yeah, I think I think in British Council website, website yeah, uh, uh, I've seen some some uh, resources on that, right? Maybe I need mm. to come back there and really? check it and maybe post that in the group, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question here from Pa Asep. Pa Asep is a very active participant here, Ibu Lucy. Uh, Bu, uh, I absolutely agree with you in TEYL. First, we have to identify, we have to know our students, what, you know, what their needs are, their profiles. But the problem is, form teacher education itself, most of us has, as a teacher educator, sometimes doesn't care about our students, uh, our students' progress, perhaps. It can be proved where do we never use English in any single activities, even in our teachers, uh, English teachers group community? So how do we build their awareness to elevate their willingness in mastering English where they need figures in it? Perhaps like just to raise awareness, you know, uh, Ibu Lucy, uh, among teacher educators or among teachers themselves. I think that's the 
the, the important point of uh, Pa'asep's okay. question. Okay. Thank you for this. Is, this is a very interesting question, Pa'asep. Uh, is Pa'asep a uh, teacher educator or, or teacher? I'm sorry, I mean, uh, are you teaching future teachers or, or students? Oh, okay. Anyway, so it's about how to build uh, awareness, uh, willingness in mastering English, okay? So let me talk about uh, teacher first. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the center of the teaching learning process is students, yeah? So we, we are there for, for, for the students. We, we as teachers are there uh, to change our students, to make them grow, yeah, to elevate them. And I think a uh, teacher, before everything, teacher need to realize their duty, I think, I think, yeah. Okay, so the key is on the teacher, whether they understand the essence of being a teacher, whether they understand the goal or the direction they need to go when they are with the students, you know. So understanding direction, understanding goal is, I think, is very important, yeah, uh, to, mm. to, to raise this, this awareness. And the second is, I think, the teacher need to do self reflect, yeah, asking about their own motivation. Actually, what do you do? They want to reach, yeah. So what? Or maybe we can talk on many perspective, yeah, religious or spiritual perspective, perhaps, yeah, or humanity perspective, yeah. So the, if if we as a teacher, we have a, uh, we are ordered by the government right to give our best for our students and we if we miss this if we didn't realize this no wonder yeah our efforts to help the students or to build them up maybe will be very limited you know uh, maybe we need to do a lot of self-reflection you know, why 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 do we do like we why do we do like this is it something good is it something bad what should i do better in the future we, we need to keep thinking about that yeah because again yeah being teacher or educator is it's like important amanah i think yeah from the government and also from god because we are teacher we are, we are in this uh when we are in this field this is our everything yeah maybe for me yeah being a teacher is like the key for us yeah to heaven as well, yeah. That's if we talk about spiritual or religious aspect, yeah. So that's why we need to be very responsible. And when we know that we need to understand our students, then we need to do efforts in that. We need to find information about our learners. Yeah. I know it is very hard. I also I felt the same thing. Yeah. It's not easy to understand our student, but at least let's let's do something on that. Okay. So I think again. Uh, the key is on whether or not we understand our our goal by becoming a teacher, and then do we have a uh, sufficient or uh, do we have a uh, great motivation? Yeah, to do our best for uh, our students and also ourselves, maybe. Yeah, because I think yeah. if the students happy, we also be happy. You know, yeah. and there are many other things. I think. Sure. Do you think I I answered the question, Pak Mahmud? I think you did, Ibu. It's it's about tanggung jawab dunia akhirat, right, Ibu? <laughs> More or less like that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, one last question here and we still have two more minutes, uh, Ibu Lucy. If we have limited time in teaching our students, uh, this is from Pak Teguh, I think. Uh, what are the vital materials to teach? which we might deliver them quickly as it is their last step in learning English at school. Wajib belajar 12 tahun. Hmm, what are the vital materials to teach? Okay. Hmm, materials like... I'm not sure about the, the, the vital, like the essential yeah. materials to teach perhaps. Or skills perhaps? I... Yeah, perhaps, yeah. So, well, uh, this is a very challenging question. So, from what Quite perspective? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
from what perspective if if well if you talk about uh, from the perspective of assessment for example we don't have that anymore yeah actually mm. yeah yeah okay i think if by referring to ibu anita's uh, response yeah about the importance of communication i think you have you need to need you you need to identify uh maybe skills maybe uh, uh, materials that will contribute a lot to meaningful communication that your students will deal with in the near future yeah. and the future yeah that's theory you know that's theory like that you know uh <laughs> it's very hard you know? <laughs> because you've got curriculum for you to follow yeah bapak yeah okay uh uh yeah, yeah? Like, i assume i think it's very hard i think all materials are equally important yeah ibu lucy I think so, but uh, when we connect this discussion with the learners, yeah, I think my okay. my answer will be those needed by the students. Yeah, that's why I think needs analysis yep. is very important. Yeah, what what do they need? Why do they need to learn English? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that's that's my answer. Yeah, so just just give anything that your students will need in the future. That will be the vital or essential materials for you to deliver in the classroom yeah. maybe that's my diplomatic answer <laughs> all right thank you so much ibu lucy and ibu uh, prof anita also agrees with you uh, being a teacher is our pahala pathway to heaven yep completely agree with you prof okay so i think that's the end of our uh, second uh, webinar today's webinar uh, again, I would like to express my gratitude for Ibu Lucy and also Ibu uh, Prof Anita to make time to be able to attend this webinar and present and share your experiences, uh, your what you uh, your insights to all of us here. Again, uh, on behalf of Beltane and also uh, British Council Indonesia, we would like to thank you very much. So I think I'm going to give the session to Ibu Didi or to Pak Dimas. I'm a bit lost here. <laughs> Is that, it will to be, that will be to me, Bapak. Uh, to, yes, to Pak MC, Pak Dimas. Okay, it's all yours now, Pak Dimas. Thank you very much uh, once again to our remarkable speakers, Professor Anita Lee and also Dr. Lucy Nurhayati for the thought-provoking and also eye-opening insights into the future directions of teaching of English to young learners in Indonesia. A warm thank you is also extended to Pak Mahmud Layan Hutasuhut, PhD, for chairing the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, We would like to inform some information about what is happening in January from the British Council. The first information is a report regarding the artificial intelligence and English language teaching preparing for the future. How is artificial intelligence or AI being used for English language teaching and learning or ELTL worldwide? What are the opportunities, issues, and challenges? Educational technology experts working with the British Council looked at the current literature and consulted a range of people to understand their views on this subject. To get the full access to the report, the link will be sent to the chat box. Also, if you are interested in receiving information about the British Council Facebook event, the link is also provided in the chat box. The second information is about a mini event focusing on different approaches to technology in the classroom. This is a webinar exploring the British Council's latest report on AI in ELT. It will be followed by three webinars with ELT teachers and experts from around the world. All webinars will help English teachers think about how they use technology in the classroom. The webinars are dedicated 
for teachers of primary, secondary, and young adult English language learners. The event will take place on Thursday, January 18th, 2024. If you are interested in participating, our team will send the link to the chat box. Another fruitful event taking place in January is the six-month self-study course about how to teach vocabulary. It consists of three modules, and they all help your learners notice, record, recycle, and use new vocabulary more confidently with engaging classroom activities. The link to know more about this self-study course will also be provided in the chat box. Another event taking place in January is the four-week tutored course consisting of four modules to develop beginner digital skills and learn how to use documents, worksheets, presentations, and video conferencing to enhance your teaching. To know more about this tutored course, the link will also be provided. Lots of events taking place in January and the final event is the three month self-study course about how to teach grammar. Consisting of three modules and it helps discover how to help your learners notice, make sense of, and become more confident using grammar with engaging, meaning-focused teaching. Learn about deductive and inductive approaches to grammar teaching, how to evaluate the best approach for your learners, and identify contexts and tasks which encourage noticing. The link to this self-study course will also be provided in the chat box. To all participants, please submit your feedback through this link, which you can scan the barcode, and our team will also send the link to the chat box. The feedback link also serves as your attendance checker. Plus, if you're interested in becoming a Peltin member, the link to our member registration will be sent to the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss out our third webinar of the first trend, which will be held next week on Saturday, January 20th, 2024. The third webinar is entitled, What Teacher Education Can Do to Address Contemporary Needs in English Language Teaching, or ELT. Mm -hmm. Dr. Willie A. Renandia, the principal lecturer from the English Language and Literature Department of National Institute of Education, Singapore, mm -hmm. and Ibu Tina Priantin, MPD, a lecturer from Universitas Pakuan Bogor and the chapter coordinator of Peltin, are the speakers of the third webinar. Once again, thank you very much to all participants, speakers, mm -hmm. Bapak Ibu from Peltin and also from the British Council. On behalf of Peltin and the British Council, I'm Dimas Pujianto signing off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dima. Thank you very much, Prof. Anita Bolusi, you, for your willingness. Thank you. See you next Nadia. occasion. Ibu Lucy, Pak Dimas, Pak Mahmud. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so much, Prof. I'm leaving also. Wish you all the best. Wish Thank you all you. the best, too, Prof. Say hi, Pat. Have a great weekend. Sama. Amen. Enjoy your weekend. Bye bye, Ibu. You too. You too, Dimas.